So this week we're going to cover elevation um, and the concept of relief. We're going to use uh, two softwares. One, uh, our map, which we used um, a couple weeks ago. And then uh, we're going to use a new program called Fugro. So the reading talks about um, different kinds of terrain and the, the idea that when we look at a terrain we're trying to get a three-dimensional idea um, of the surface and that value or that um, elevation value is often represented as, a, as the letter Z. When we think about latitude and longitude coordinates we use the, the X, ah, the Y and the X if I say it right and then the Z often stands for um, the elevation. So couple things to think about. We can talk about relief, uh, relative relief and local relief. Um, I'm just going to change that to local relief. And that's on a small scale. So, you know, the relief around my neighborhood is probably from 400 feet up to the top of Spencer's Butte. And I don't know what the Butte uh, elevation is. Or you can look at relief based on, you know, larger scale, the whole, the, the scale of the state from sea level up to, uh, as my, I don't know if Mount Hood's the ho highest point. So um, it really means the change in elevation from the lowest point to the highest point, and it can be in an entire country or in a county or in a neighborhood. So um, we'll talk a little bit when we look at some topographic maps about kind of the, the uh, relief from one place to another. The chapter reading um, divides relief maps or relief into two uh, basic types. One is relative relief, uh, the other is absolute relief. And with absolute relief, uh, we're looking at um, a piece of data, a number, that tells me exactly what the elevation is. Uh, so 50 feet, 100 feet, a contour line, whatever, that, that you know exactly what that elevation is at that point. Uh, relative relief is often just um, the impression that you're, you're, you can tell high ground from low ground and um, you may not know exactly how much higher, higher it is. It might look twice as high, but you don't have a, a hard number to compare that. So we'll start with absolute relief. Um, and so there's lots of ways that absolute relief is shown on a map. Um, often um, you see that as a spot elevation or a, a USGS benchmark. Sometimes you can see absolute relief um, in brass caps. So here it's a 717 feet from the US uh, s survey benchmark. Um, and usually when we're talking about absolute relief, we're talking about um, so many feet or so many meters above this idea of, of average sea level. And that, that number is critical if you want to do high level analysis. So here's some examples on a topographic map. Um, a benchmark um, is an X marks the spot, so the, the benchmark here is 241, or the elevation here is 241. You also can just have a spot elevation. So here is an X, doesn't have the, the letter benchmark, or BM. So I would expect to find a brass cap somewhere there. Spot elevation here is 220. Sometimes you'll see a triangle at the top of a mountain with an elevation. Um, so there's lots of ways that you can just find that elevation at a point. So I want you to think about if I if you're given a topo map, um, topographic map, how do I know whether this is feet or inches or meters? What is that elevation unit? When you're talking about um, ocean surfaces, the, uh, the point data is, is called a sounding, um, and it's kind of this uh, uh, sonar echo pulse, and it bounces back, and you can, um, the um, monitors can tell how deep that is. So um, when you uh, create a sounding, um, how far down below the surface it is, it's not based on average sea level. Um, it's based on a 19-year average of the low water. So think about that. Why would they not use um, 
that zero sea level at the shore and use a low water average. The other way that um, line or on a map contour lines are or elevation is shown is through isolines, and an isoline um, is. Uh, on a map shows lines of continuous values of some kind of data. So you can have elevation isolines, which we're going to look at, which are contour lines, um, air pressure isobars, temperatures would be isotherms, and these lines that we saw um, here would be isobaths, so the lines of, of elevation or of uh, um, C or bathymetry, sorry. Okay, so here's an example of just isobars showing um, barometric pressure. So, pressure. So, uh, in theory, if you were able to walk along this line, you would be walking at about um, 106 uh, millibars of pressure. And here it would be 280, and here a thousand. So, if, as long as you walk along that bar, your elevation is not going to change much. The way contour lines are created, um, basically an area is surveyed and the elevation of those survey points is plotted. And then it's kind of a game of connect the dots. So a line uh, goes through the, the absolute 40s and then kind of extrapolates between the other values. So, you know, in theory, again, if I were to walk along um, that first circle that goes through the 40 point, I would be walking at an elevation of, let's say, 40 feet, not going downhill or uphill. And so then um, the next uh, contour line is drawn. And so if I want to make lines every 10 feet, I would try to find a 30 uh, elevation value. So it's Here's zero, so I know that my 32 is running through there. Um, and then you end up with this contour map that you know basically uh, gives you a sense of the elevation um, in, in a certain area or on the landscape. So if you, um, oops, skipped one, here we go. So if I look at this in plan view, um, you see the contour lines um, on this little island. And if you were to look at this in profile, you would see that at zero elevation, you're walking all along the bottom of the island. Um, and the contour interval, or the, the elevation change, or the, right, the elevation change between the contour lines on this map is 500 feet. So that's called the contour interval. So here I'm at 500 feet, and if I walked around all the way here, I would stay at 500 feet in elevation. Um, there's 1,000 feet in elevation. Walk around here, 1,500 feet in elevation, all the way up uh, to the top of the hill. And you can see that the contour stops at 3,000 feet, but the actual elevation of this little mountain is 3,047 feet. So there might be, on a topographic map, a little triangle or some kind of spot elevation marker. The other thing you notice um, on this map is that these lines are farther apart. So I have to walk farther to go 500 feet in elevation than I do right here. And you see that in the bottom right-hand map, um, where the contour lines are very close together, which indicates a steeper surface than on the west side of the island, where the contour lines are far apart, which indicates um, a, a more shallow surface. One thing that we used to do a lot in uh, fluvial and geomorphology, looking at hydrology, was to create an elevation profile. And so um, this was a way to get that uh, three-dimensional look, or what does the, you know, if you turned the landscape on its side, what would that actually look like? And so here you can see that uh, there's a 10-foot contour here. And so um, I don't think they drew the 10-foot line. Yeah, so here's a 10-foot drop-down line uh, at 10 foot in elevation, here is the line dropping down at 20 foot in elevation, and you can create a nice profile that gives you that um, elevation change. One of the things that's really nice about um, GIS and, and digital 
is that you don't have to do that by hand anymore. So there is a little app on Google Earth uh, or associated with Google Earth um, that will draw a profile um, across contour lines. Um, and so I just thought that gives a nice, you can see that uh, these lines are, are closer together than along the valley floor. The contour lines are far apart down here and you get this flat valley. Some information about contour lines. One is that they do represent uh, lines of equal uh, elevation. I think I'm repeating myself here. Um, and they're based on usually that uh, mean sea level is, is set at zero, so they're above sea level. And then the contour interval indicates how much elevation change between those contour lines. Another thing to think about is that contour lines are closed features. So on this map, I see this 350 foot, I'm assuming this is feet, contour line. And I can follow it all the way through Franklinville um, under the highway. And it closes back in on itself. And then if you look inside the town, there's a, a lighter contour line that closes in. If I look down here at the bottom of the map, I drew a little blue contour line. If I were able to put the map that's adjacent to this, I would be able to connect these contour lines and they would be continuous. Another feature about contour lines is that the shape of the, the contour gives you an indication of what direction, up or down, you're going. So sometimes you might get um, a piece of a map or zoom in on a map and I can see that this is 3,000 feet but I may not know um, that this is lower elevation. One way to tell that is that the curved, uh, the, the gentle curved lines tend to point down slope. And then the opposite of that is that the pointed lines um, point uphill. So the V is, the point of the V is pointing uphill. This is a great tool when you're trying to decide um, if I know this contour line, what is this next one? And I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm going up or down. So, um, and this is due basically to that cutback um, from erosion. It creates that upside down V. Sometimes you can look at uh, the shape of a slope from, from from contours and you can see that um, right here that's the lines are closer together it's pretty steep and then at the top of that slope they spread out so it's a little a little more gradual. There are several special kinds of contour lines that you need to be able to identify. The index line is the bold line and often has the elevation value. So this 300, and again I'm assuming it's feet, this 300 foot uh, darker line is the index line. And then the other contour lines in between are called intermediate lines. Um, often this is a darker brown, thicker line, and these are lighter brown. You also could find supplemental contour lines on your map. So uh, there's a dashed line that has a supplemental and it will tell you at the bottom of the map what the contour interval is and what the supplemental contour interval. So you see contour intervals a lot when you have very little elevation change. So um, if you look at some of the maps of the uh, Willamette Valley, you'll see often uh, two types of supplemental lines. One could be a 10-foot supplemental line and the other could be a 5-foot supplemental line. Oh, I renumbered here. That's not helpful. We'll leave it for now. Um, the fourth type of uh, contour line is called a depression. Uh, indicates indicates kind of a, a change in elevation into a hole or into um, oh, you see them a lot in karst topography or in caves, and these are indicated by little hatched lines pointing to the inside of the um, the contour. So when you try to read the elevation on a contour depression, what you need to know is that the first depression line is the same elevation as the unhatched line. So basically what it's saying is that this 1200 foot elevation 
um, it stays 1200 feet until it gets to the edge of this uh, second interior 1200 foot circle and then it begins to uh, go lose elevation and the contour interval um, for depressions is the same as the contour interval for um, the, your regular uh, contour lines. And so here's an example just showing um, some supplemental contours here. So all of those show absolute relief. Even though the contour lines are extrapolated, um, this gives me a number to work with. Uh, so and then the other kind, we'll talk about another kind of absolute in just a minute. So I'm going to switch now to relative relief. And relative relief really just gives you a context or an idea of what's higher. And it also will often provide a, a three-dimensional effect. So you see that in shading, um, in raised relief uh, maps. And that gives you the idea of a planimetric perspective. And, and that has uh, special lighting and shading so it makes you it makes it appear as if you're looking at an object from um, a, a higher angle or from a plane and you see this a lot in globes you can have um, uh, three-dimensional globes or uh, globes with relief on it and uh, it gives you a general sense of hills and valleys and they help people kind of get a sense of uh, just kind of visualize the landscape. One of the things on a globe is in order to see that elevation, um, the, the uh, exaggeration or the, the Z value has to be so much bigger than it is uh, in the real world. You also see um, this idea of relative relief in, in relief models. So I can tell you know that the valley is lower and the mountains are higher because I can physically see that. I don't have I don't have any information that tells me is this two times higher um, or, or is this at sea level. I, I don't have any information on that. So they're, they're just good to give you a general perspective. You also, also can see um, raised relief on some topographic maps and then you see shaded relief uh, cartographically um, where if you touch this you wouldn't feel any elevation difference but the shading and the shadows give you that sense that the center of the United States is flat I see a mountain range here and I see uh, the, the valley in California the Willamette Valley and the rest of it's pretty crinkled up and then you can uh, get very clear very distinct hill shade um, renderings. This is a digital map that used um, a hill shade effect and then it very effectively used a little bit of symbol symbol symbology to um, show other features on the landscape. One of the really nice things about this map <clears throat> is that there's a small inset map um, that kind of shows you where this is. One of the bad things about this map is if I don't know where St. Mary diversion facilities are. I don't know what state, what county, that would really be helpful um, in the map. Also, I think the North Arrow is too big, personally. Okay, so sometimes you see a combination on maps. So here is a map that gives me absolute relief. There's contour elevations. Here is a spot elevation for the top of uh, Mount Helen. Um, I see some index lines. There's the uh, 12,000 foot index line. And I also, this map has been shaded so that it visually gives me that sense of uh, elevation and change. Here's another example using um, a tinted color map excuse me, with hill shade effect very effectively because it really does show the canyon here. Um, but it also has contour lines that would give and spot elevation that would give me absolute elevation information. And and my own personal favorite is uh, this, mount, this map of uh, Crater Lake, which again shows um, contour intervals and contour lines. Uh, there's some spot elevations, uh, water uh, depths, but also shading. 
<clears throat> that shows um, at Munson. You can see this ridge uh, and, and the Kerr Valley. You see the shadows that really show that ridge. So up to now, um, the data that we have been using, that you've been adding and creating, has been uh, a type of data model called a vector data model. And in ArcGIS, vectors are points, lines, or polygons. And points represent kind of one dimension. Usually, uh, I mean, always it's, a, it's an x, y value. Um, or, God, you know, that's so confusing. Or latitude, longitude, which would really be, I think they have to decide which way they're going to go with this in ArcGIS and Google Earth and kind of talk about it. But anyway, uh, the latitude is Y and the longitude is uh, X. All right, but in math, you talk about it differently, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's a point. So when we um, added, uh, what did we add? When you went out with the GPSs and collect data, collected data, you collected point data and you added an attribute. A line is considered uh, two dimensions uh, because it has a length to it. Um, and you need at least two coordinate pairs um, to make a line, one at the beginning of the line and one at the end of the line. And if I were looking at the uh, database for this particular line, I would have a, a coordinate here, a coordinate here, a coordinate here, and a coordinate here. Um, and then a polygon. Whoops, where'd we go? A polygon has um, at least four coordinate pairs. It has the beginning coordinate pair, and, and then the last co coordinate um, is the same as the first coordinate, so it closes the circle. Um, and so if I had a triangle, I would have uh, three vertices on a triangle, but I would need four coordinate pairs to indicate that that triangle closed. And um, a misconception with the kind of new GIS folks is that um, they think of a polygon as being a regular feature, triangle, square, hexagon, blah, blah, blah. But a polygon just means a closed uh, feature with at least four coordinates. So this is a perfectly beautiful polygon. The data that we're going to use in uh, the labs today, we're going to use some vector data for roads and for uh, urban growth boundaries. But the data that we're going to use to create um, elevation and uh, relative relief is called uh, raster data. And raster data is um, based on the idea that um, an area is covered with a grid. Uh, and, and the grid has an, an origin, so it's the beginning of the, uh, usually the upper, uh, the northwest corner of a grid is the origin, and it will give you the, the x and the y location for that point. And then um, a raster has uh, in information about the size of the cell and how many rows and columns. So if you have that information, you can build an array or a grid. And each grid has one value associated with that. So in a digital elevation model, uh, which is a raster file, each cell has one value, which would be the elevation of that cell. And that cell could cover um, a one meter square of the Earth's surface, where it would be have a very high resolution, or it could cover a 10 meter square. And so or it could cover a kilometer square. I've had I've used some data that was uh, climate data, and it was uh, average temperature data for each square kilometer of the Earth's surface. So that's very coarse resolution. So you can imagine that when you get uh, raster data, you're getting kind of an average over the surface, um, and that. Uh, average is given one data. You can also have rasters that show type of vegetation so that each cell would be given the predominant ve vegetation type for that grid. But we're going to work with digital elevation models and this these data give you absolute relief because if I click this square with the information tool or the identify tool I'm going to get a value for elevation for that square um, in the data field. Uh, let's see, so they represent, you can model them this way, kind of this three-dimension shape. So um, if each of these squares, I wish they had put a number on these instead of a color, but um, 
digital elevation models are continued a, a continuous surface. So um, everything on the Earth's surface has an elevation. So they, it's not like a road where you can be on a road or off a road. Elevation, temperature, um, air pressure, these are all continuous values. So this digital elevation model then could be represented in ArcGIS with a shading effect that would give it this three-dimensional uh, relative relief look. And so here's an example. If you stare really closely, you can see each of these little grids is a little bit different color. Um, and if you click the identify, this tool, this grid was uh, 515 feet, and this grid was 513 feet. So we use uh, DEMs to derive other raster products. And so you're going to have a DEM um, provided for you of uh, Eugene and Springfield and you're going to create a 3D uh, relative relief effect using the Hillshade tool. Um, you can also create other rasters uh, from a DEM. You can get slope, aspect, um, you can create uh, stream flow channel hydrology with a DEM. So they're really um, important uh, tools for analysis. And I had a really good slide somewhere about uses. Hold on, I'm going to, don't look, because I'm going to, uh, wait, I'll pause. Yeah, here it was. I skipped it in the, in the beginning. So um, we use terrain and elevation lots of ways just for wayfinding. You know, I, I need to kind of look at a map and see, okay, where's the high point? Where's the low point? Where am I? You know, where am I going? I can see that peak. Um, the, the absolute elevation is not going to matter to me if I'm just wayfinding kind of in general. But we need uh, absolute relief to calculate um, other important aspects of geography, such as I need to know the runoff, so I need the slope. Um, in order to figure out the speed uh, to calculate erosion or predict how much erosion. Again, I'm going to need a, I'm going to need slope for that uh, to figure out stream flow. I'll need slope, and I'm going to get that from a DEM. Uh, urban planners use ground slope to figure out stormwater runoff. Uh, when we try to site a solar panel, uh, wind turbine, water uh, water energy um, dams, you need to know elevation. And then they're used in resource planning and just kind of general planning. So we use uh, these relative and absolute relief models all the time. So um, on the left here is a, uh, a hill shade that was created from a digital elevation model. Um, and there's two here. One you can see has a very high resolution. It's each grid is is a half a meter. Um, and on the right, it's a little choppier. It's a little less clear. And the resolution for this DEM was 10 meters. So I think you're going to be using. Ten, I don't remember now. You'll have to look. It's I, actually it's 32 feet by 32 feet. Um, oh yeah, so that's 10 meter. It's derived from 10 meter DEM. So um, why is this one so much more clear than this one? Well, the one on the left was created from a newer technology called LIDAR. And LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. I've seen it written uh, as all caps. I've seen it written this way, and I have not seen a confirmation of which is correct. But LIDAR is a technique of active remote sensing. Um, when we take photographs, we're using passive remote sensing. We're actually using um, some kind of light source, solar energy, to reflect uh, images. Active remote sensing means that we're sending out some kind of signal. And with LIDAR, we're sending out we an airplane is sending out a laser a pulse. Uh, and with that, it uh, has GPS location information. And it's collecting the bounce back or the scattered light. And between the sending of the pulse and the return, um, that time involved is used to determine the distance from the surface and therefore the elevation. So um, LIDAR sends out about 400,000 pulses of light per second.
This, th these files are huge, 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 huge. I have the Willamette Valley LiDAR set, and I think it's 15 gigabytes, no, 100 gigabytes. I, it's huge. It's just gigundous. Um, so when we work with LiDAR, in this class, we kind of find little pieces of LiDAR to work with. But um, what LiDAR will do is provide, at the very base level, the lat long and the elevation. It will also kind of send out the intensity. And from that information, um, the uh, often data vendors that provide LiDAR will, will separate those pulses into the ground hits and all of the highest hits. And the ground hits give you kind of the bare earth look. So I'm going to flip here to Mount St. Helens. This was a bare earth model. You can see that there are no trees, no buildings, no cars. Everything's been removed because the LiDAR uh, signals were only collected that were um, those ground hit that had to go the farthest. Um, let's see, where am I going? So. Um, and then the highest hits can give you tree canopy. I've seen uh, power lines pulled out of high hit LiDAR data. Building uh, footprints, tops of buildings, elevations are used with LiDAR. So uh, the first lab you're going to do is creating a hill shade and creating contour lines with a DEM. Um, and then looking at some data points that you collected or data points associated with a school data uh, point file and just kind of comparing the DEM elevation for the, the elevation based on your GPS's or this school file. And then on uh, Thursday we're going to uh, look at some LiDAR data uh, using a program called Fugro which will let you look at the LiDAR point cloud. So um, all of the data that's collected by LiDAR is considered a point cloud and you'll be able to symbolize it into elevation ranges and data types and create a, just a really beautiful um, uh, profile.